Well, I suppose we should get started. <laughs> Sorry, I'm running late. Well, huh, well, All right, well, let me uh, begin with a word of prayer. So, here we go. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. I thank you for these students. I just ask that you bless this class. Help us to glorify you and what we do this day, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I know you guys are um, just waiting with eager anticipation for this. So, here we go. There we go. Um, so, this is lecture 15. The top hat code, as you can see, is 5870. And um, so, we're covering today, roughly speaking, sections 13.3, 13.4. Um, I, can, I can cross the, uh, I can fix this here. This is incorrect. Here we go. Do, 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 do. There we go. Fixed. Okay, so um, yeah, we will not get to 13.5 today. In fact, if you look at the course schedule, what I have planned for this week is actually just up through 13.3, but I'm going to try to get a section ahead today so that you guys can work on those homework problems if you want to, all right? Um, so anyway, let's get to it. Any questions? When's our quiz? Quiz two is when? A week from now, right? So let's get to it. So today we are talking about a few different things, but to start with we're going to talk about z-scores. All right, so what is a z-score? All right. <clears throat> um, so a z-score, if I can find my laser, oh I don't need a laser. Hmm. Oh man, I left my laser back in the office. I'll have to make do. So um, the z-score, what it does is it measures how far the data is away from the mean, all right? So, um, you know, if you have a z-score of one, that means that you're one standard deviation above the mean. If you have a z-score of two, your two standard deviations above the mean. Now, if you have a z-score of minus one, that means you're one standard deviation below the, below the 
um, below the mean. So um, the definition of z-score is different for population than for sample, all right? Well, there, that's not entirely correct. I mean, it is kind of the same formula, right? You take, you take your, your data minus the mean, you divide by the standard deviation. That's true for both. See that? So we take x minus mu over sigma for the z-score for a population data point. We take x minus the mean over the, over the standard deviation for a sample data point. So you can calculate the z-score of any piece of data that you have, all right, and that will describe how far that piece of data is away from the average in terms of the standard deviation. Um, but we do need to keep in mind that the standard deviation is defined by the square root of the sums of the squares of the differences. Seems like I'm missing a parenthesis right here, doesn't it? Oh man, this pen is fresh. There we go, like that. Um, so we, we divide by n for a population, whereas we divide by n minus one for a sample. Um, I was asking my wife about this and she, she Googled it. She told me that that's Bessel's correction, so. I haven't looked into this further, but I, I, I've asked some of the other faculty, like, why is it n minus one? Why are you dividing by n minus one? And so far, the answer I have received from, from, from people I've talked to is it, it, it makes the uh, estimates come out better for the application of the statistics. So, like, you can mathematically prove that it's better to divide by n minus one there. And uh, that's about as far as, uh, that's pretty much what your book says. So I don't feel like that's an explanation personally, but anyway. We do need to, what's the difference between a sample and a population again? A sample is a incomplete set of data of part of a larger story, right? It's a sample. Whereas the population is the entirety of the data of whatever you're talking about describing. Um, so three examples I have here. If you have a z-score of three for data x, then that means that the data is three standard deviations above the mean, all right? If you have a z-score of minus two for data x, it means you have two standard deviations below the mean, all right? So here's a, here's a more interesting one. I say Kakashi. Kakashi has uh, taken two tests in his math class. He scored a 72 on test one with an average, and that test had an average of 65 and a standard deviation of eight, all right? And then, Kakashi scored a 60 on test two, and that test had an average of 45 and a standard deviation of 12, right? So in terms of absolute score, let's think about it, right? You might be tempted to think he really did worse on the second test, right? Because he's 15 points. Well, wait a minute, no. He's 15 points. Well, let me say it this way. He, he had a 72 on test one, right? He got a 60 on test two. Just on the face of it, it looks like he did, did better on test one, right? Mm -hmm. But if we think about his test score relative to the class, you can see that his performance was better, right? On test two, because on, on, on test two, even though he made a lower score, his Z score was 0.875, because you take 72, you know, minus the uh, 72. So this is his score minus the average divided by the standard deviation for test two. Um, this is test two, rather. For test one, you had 72 minus 65 over eight. So his z-score for test one was 0.875, whereas his z-score for test two was 60 minus 45 over 12, which is 1.25. So what that means is that relative to the average, he's more above the average for the second test than the first test, e even though technically his score was lower. That's kind of an interesting idea, right? So z-score gives you a way of like quantifying being better than the average in a somewhat more quantitative way than just saying I'm better than the average, right? I mean, so um, any questions so far? All right, let us, let us do another. So the next one is, um, It lets you guys, I hope you have written down the definition of z-score because I'm about to ask you to calculate some. All right. So here we go. 
Top Hat Quiz. So I have Dark Brandon, scored a 50 on, uh, oh man, that was page two, wasn't it? I'll get it eventually. Come on, pen. I gotta keep these in order, order otherwise I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in trouble. So Dark Brandon scored a 50 on a test with an average of 60 and a standard deviation of five. Ron Swanson scored a 93 on a test with an average of 97 and a standard of deviation of one. My question then is, who did worse relative to their respective classes? Enter the z-scores for each into Top Hat. All right, so give me a minute and I'll have the places where you can put the z-scores in. I gotta bend the Top Hat to my will. So, in the meantime, you guys calculate those, okay? So has everyone already um, top-hatted? Obviously not. I have 77 people who've top-hatted out of 99. I'm guessing there's more than 77 here. The top-hat code was 5870. Going once. If you want me to wait, raise your hand. Going twice. 5870. Mm So I'm actually going to only ask you to put in the z-score for one of them, but um, we'll talk about for both, okay? All right, here goes nothing. I really, if I end up uh, making this thing go all Hulk on us again, I'm gonna regret doing this. Let's see here, hopefully, it just, it worries me to move wires around up here, you know? Some of the things that have happened here before. All right, so I will switch us over to the other. funny. Why are there only 63 of you seeing the question? 65? I guess it's taking time. 67? 68 of you see the question? I should get to 78 at least. Yeah?
You guys have big plans this weekend? Yeah? No? Is it like a Chick-fil-A opening somewhere? I mean, what's, what's going on? No? I once had students who wanted to miss class because they wanted to go camp out at Chick-fil-A to try to get the free chicken for a while. If you get to like the, if you're like the first person to buy something, when a Chick-fil-A opens, it gives you something. I think you get like free breakfast. I'm trying to remember. I guess it varies on the franchise, but. Well. So this is weird to me because 78 people have top hatted today, but only 72 of you are seeing the question. So there's six of you who are just like not answering the question. Is that right? Or does that mean six people left? <laughs> All right, I'm going to shut this thing down here in about 20 seconds. So if you need more time than 20 seconds, raise your hand, please. I see one. Okay. Well, 70. That's good. Oh, here. I'll add a 60 second timer. Hey, where'd you go? Yeah, but I wanted the big, annoying, you know. Come back. Why wouldn't it? That's weird. Like, why, why wouldn't it stay down there, you know? It had that, like, big old circle-y thing. I didn't click anything. It just disappeared. Yeah. Whoa. Nice. Yesterday, I had a really impressive sneeze in one of my classes. Like, it was notable. Oh, there it is. All right, I'm going to close this thing. Stop answering. All right, so how do I see submissions closed? Responses. We've got 43 correct, 40, 43 of you got it right, and so the answer was negative four was right. So I would say what this means, ahem, I think what this means is 11 of you, 11 of you found minus four, looked at it and went, no, it's got to be positive. Right? So they can be negative. That, that is possible. 98. So this is, this is, this is, uh, this right here, this is what I call diversity. <laughs> Look at this diversity of answers, right? Our class is stronger now. <laughs> so there you go. All right, let's put this away. Can you explain how we get that again? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain now. Oh. Hmm, I think that beats the hiccup. <laughs> let's see here. It's not a contest, though, folks. All right, so I do have a whistle. I can go get it. I'm kind of competitive, so. All right, so to calculate, why is this tilted? I guess it's my paper. Huh. Funny. All right, so um, to calculate the z-score of the, uh, the dark, why have I got a 50 there? Oh, he scored 50. I'm an idiot. I, I, I was looking at it. I saw the 60 under the brand, and I thought he scored a 60 because I can't read my own question. Dummy. Um, me, not you. So <laughs> I scored a 50 on a test with an average of 60 and a standard deviation of 5. So I take um, the average. Let's see here. No, the, I take the score minus the average divided by the number of standard deviations, right? 
So that gives me minus 10 over 5, which means his z-score, uh, Dark Brandon's z-score was minus 2, right? Ron Swanson, on the other hand, you got 93 minus 97 over 1, which gives us minus 4 over 1, which gives us minus 4. So Ron Swanson did worse. He was much further below the, even though he made a 93, right? He made a 93 versus Dark Brandon making a, a 50. You'd think that Ron Swanson, you know, did better, but he didn't relative to his class, right? Um, and, you know, so I guess the question is this, 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 you know, qualification better, is that like a, you know, when you say something is better, it's a little bit fuzzy, right? So I think whether or not it's really better depends on how things work, right? If you're graded on a curve, if your grade is ultimately judged by your relative position to other people, then the z-score really, really matters, right? And here, does it matter? No. Do I curve tests? I do not, <laughs> right? Because I replace your test with your final exam grade if helpful. So, I mean, um, so this is also good news, right? Because if everybody makes a 95 in here, make, suppose the average is 95, right? And then you make a 93. If I'm grading on the curve, then you just made a C, you know, which is kind of annoying, right? And um, you might think that that's kind of an esoteric thing, but it's not. Like my, my wife went to high school in Hong Kong, and they have these sort of entrance exams. It's like a two-tiered system where they have like the lower high school and the higher high school. And so the higher part of the high school is sort of competitive. You have to pass these certain exams in order to get into certain programs. And she would actually hope that the test would be, would be a much harder rather than easier, because if it was too easy, every single person makes like a 98 on the test and it comes down to just like this little wiggle room of you know the last two percent completely judges your position relative to the others which then judges which high school you can go to for the second half so if you're in that kind of system then z-score really is relevant and you can't really judge your score by absolute score you have to judge it relatively you know but anyway most of us are not in that situation right <clears throat> Actually, I, I, I don't know, maybe you are. Um, do your other classes grade on the curve? No? Yes? Don't know? Find out later. All right, so next up, let's talk about percentiles. So here's the definition. A value x is called the pth percentile, or you could say the value x is in the pth percentile I don't know, I guess. It's called the pth percentile of a data set provided that p percent of the data values are less than x. The less than x is important, all right? So if you're, for example, just hypothetical, um, can you be in the hundredth percentile then? Technically, no, right? Because to be in the hundredth percentile, you'd have to be over all of the other scores, right? Which is an impossibility because you're one of them. Right, so technically you couldn't be in the 100th percentile, that would be an impossibility. Um, but anyway, the way to calculate it is you take the number of data values that are less than x, all right, you divide by the total number of data values, and you multiply by 100. For example, if you had a value such that a half of the people had values less than your score, right, suppose you make a score, 50% of the class has scores that are lower than your score, right? That puts you in the 50th percentile, all right? If you make a score and you have, you know, 75% of the people in the class make a score less than your score, that puts you in the 75th percentile, right? If only 2% of the people in the class have made a score higher than yours, what percentile are you in? 98th percentile, right? Okay, so here's, here's some more specific ones. A small town in Virginia has 500 residents, all right? If the town doctor earns more than 480 of the town people, then what percentile is his income? So what I do is I take 480, that's the number with less income than him, right? I divide by 500, the total number of residents. I multiply by 100 to make it a percent, and that gives me 96. So he's in the 96th percentile, if that's the case. What's another way you could have done example four that would make it a little bit more sneaky? I could have instead told you that the doctor and um, 
you know, 19 other people, um, let's see, I could say, I could say this, I could say 19, 19 people make more money than the doctor, right? What percentile is his, his income? If 19 people make more money than him, right, that means that 480 people make money less than him because there's him and the 19 above him, right? If you think about it. Let's see here. Um, on a placement examination, Rick scored lower than 1,229 of the 12,920 students who took the exam. Find the percentile rounded to the nearest percent for Rick's score. So again, this is pretty straightforward. We take the, the um, well, this is actually a little bit sneaky because it's the issue I was just talking about. See that? I'll put it up here so you guys can see it. So I don't just take the 1229, right? Because notice that what it is, it, it, it says Rick scored lower than 1229. So that's not telling you the scores that are lower than Rick, right? To figure out Rick's percentile, you need to know the number of people who scored lower than Rick, which is this. It's, it's everybody minus the 1229. I think technically, I'm, I, what, what, what should I actually put here? What do you think? I think to be fussy, I really shouldn't do that. I should do what? I think I need to, it depends on the exact wording here, uh, 1229. Lower. So I think I should actually subtract 1,230 here, don't you? If we trust what I was just saying, I think I should tr subtract 1,230 there because he is one of those, yeah? He's one of those who scored better. Rick is one of the ones who scored better. So that just makes this, you know, zero instead of one. And I don't, that's not going to change the calculation as a thing. Um, I mean, you can try it out. What is that? Not here. Divided by twelve nine two zero times one hundred. <laughs> like, thank you, calculator. The answer is twenty nine thousand two hundred and twenty five divided by three twenty three. No. So I hit my, this button here takes it from, yeah. Uh, anyway, so we get 90.47987, blah, blah, blah. So we were just supposed to find it to the nearest um, percent. So I just round down to 90, so it's still 90. In fact, it's still 90.48 if I just keep the first, you know, two digits there. All right. So. Any questions about why I subtracted 1230 rather than 1229 there? All right, let's go on. Another example, Kevin. Sorry, I just realized I, I'm failing to number my, my pages. Here we go. Kevin scored at the 70th percentile on a test given to 9,940 9, students. How many students scored lower than Kevin? Right, so I, I'm calling X what I don't know, which is the number of students that scored lower than Kevin, right? So what we know is that X divided by 9,940 times 100 has to be equal to 70, right? Why, why do I put that equation? What am I using? What am I using there? Remember our, defin our, our formula back from page four? The percentiles is the number of data values less than x divided by the total number of data values times 100. So I guess I'm calling x the actual score. I hope that's not um, then anyway, x, I'm saying x is the number. If you don't want me to put an x here, if you only put a different letter, we could do that. Is that confusing to anybody? Here I've used x as the value that we're talking about, whereas here x is the number um, of people with scores less than, than Kevin's score. So like x 
on page four I would think of as being Kevin's score, um, which we're not given, right? We, we're not actually told Kevin's score in example six. Um, so if, if this bugs you, I'm using X in a different sense conceptually on page five versus page four. We could change the letter. Would that be better? Here, I'll do it. I'm going to change that X to a S for score. There. So. So S is the number of people with, um, let me write it down. S equals the number of students with scores lower than Kevin. All right. Does that make sense now? Yes, no, maybe so. Yes, I heard a yes. One vote for yes. 70 votes for apathy. I'll take it though. Let's see here. Okay, so I, th I think these, this material is not too bad, right? Give or take. Um, I think this is easier than what we were doing last time, don't you? In terms of the calculation, because like last time we had to take all these data and subtract them and square them and take the square root and all that stuff. Here, if you already are given the number of students and percentiles and you know the means and the standard deviations, it's pretty easy to calculate z-scores, right? So th these are nice questions, um, um, comparatively speaking. Okay, so up next, we are now to section 3.4. What is section 3.4 on? 3.4, listen to me, 13.4, which is on what? It is on normal distributions, right? What's a normal distribution? Right. So I need to do a little bit of um, background here to build up to the discussion here, okay? So normal distributions. So um, let me cheat a bit here and use the book. So this is example one from page 783. All right, and um, let me just make an adjustment here. Well, oh yeah. The danger of cutting the page out of the book is you lose track of which uh, you know which is the first and which one comes first, which comes in second. Anyway, so here is um, curses. I think I've gotten my pages out of order. No, it's okay. So this is a relative man. Sorry, guys. I knew something's wrong. I'm on the wrong page. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. So here is the one I wanted to look at. So the book starts by talking about a histogram. Do you guys know what a histogram is? No. What is a histogram? So histogram, basically it's a bar chart where you bin data into classes and make bars um, height um, according to the number in each class. All right, so here let, let's let's foolishly attempt to draw one here. Yeah, I'm sorry, am I? Oh goodness. Thank you. That is a very helpful question. Um, okay, so like example seven here. 
let's suppose you have a class and you make scores of, are you guys, call, call me out some scores between uh, 0 and 100. 72. I've got a 72. What's next? 48. 48. Okay. 29. What's that? 29. Okay. What's next? I need like I need like 30 numbers here, so keep going. 85. 85. 63. 100. 100. Okay. 22. 22. All right. 78. 55. This is your chance. 19, 19.4. Ooh, sad for them. One. I mean, on a multiple choice test, right, if you can make a four, it might mean that you're really smart and self-destructive, but yeah. One, so what do we have? Here, I'll go seven, 19, uh, let's do some better ones. 80, 82, 83, 84, 85, I'm just being lazy. Um, 90, 95, um, 99. Okay, enough. This is definitely not a normal distribution, okay? <laughs> and we're going to see that <laughs> because these numbers are actually, these, these numbers would be an example of something that doesn't have a normal distribution. Well, we're going to see it. So let's bin, let's make, what, what do you want to bin the numbers? So we'll make our bins, let's say like 0 to 10. 11 to 20. Um, th is that right? Is that this? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, let's say 1 to, 1 to 10, 11 to 20, you know, 21 to 30. You get the idea. Until we get to what? The last one would be um, 91 to 100, right? So I make a, make a chart here, okay, where I have Let's say here's my, here's my 10, 20, 30, 40. I really should have brought some graph paper. My bad, guys. Um, 60, <laughs> 70, 80, 90, 100, right? And so the histogram, what I do is the height of the bar tells me, you know, like how many I've got in each bin. So how many... How many do we have? L let's just count how many we have in each bin before I make any. Uh, I'm going to put the number down here just so I can then make the, 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 the chart properly, OK? So um, how many between 0 and 10? 1, 2, 3. We just got 3 there, right? How many, how many between 10 and 20? We had that 19. Anything else? Two 19s, yeah? One, two, how many else? Just two, right? There's just two in there. How many between t 20 and 30? One, two, 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 two between 20 and 30. Between 30 and 40, how many we got? Oh, none. How about between 40 and 50? One. Just one, huh? Between 50 and 60, how many we got? One. one. Just the one, huh? How about between 60 and 70, how many we got? One. Just one. Between 70 and 80, how many we got? One. Two. Just two, right? How about between 80 and 90, how many we got? One. Two, three, four, five, six, six. Between 90 and 100, how many we got? One, two, three, four, right? Okay, so let me make this three. I think the biggest is six, right? So between 80 and 90, we had six. So we put a, a, a bar like that. Um, there are four between 90 and 100, so that's something like this, right? Um, there are two, something like this. One. One. Right? Um, one. Nothing. 
two again, uh, and then two again, and then a three. Okay, so this is very much not, so this is a, I mean, this is a useful example because a, an interesting question perhaps on, uh, on quiz two might be, here's a, um, here's a histogram of some data. Does this data have a normal distribution? And the answer for this is decidedly no. It does not have a normal distribution. This is some kind of like maybe bimodal. It's like you've got these two different modes. You know, there's this mode over here, and it's, I don't know. It, it's it's definitely not normal, right? And so here's the, the the example in the book. On the other hand, here here's the example in the book. And here we have. Um, you know, um, I got to stay over here because I can't read it up there. The the grouped frequency distribution um, with 12 classes. So here, they have been the number of subscribers that download times between zero and five seconds, between five and ten, you know, all the way up to a minute. So what we're doing is we're they've got a bunch of subscribers, right? And they're they're this chart here shows you how long their download times were, right? So like for example. Uh, 190 of the subscribers, it, they, they, their download time in seconds was between 30 and 35 seconds, right? So to make a histogram, you have to decide like how you're going to bend the data, okay? So if you're actually trying to present data to somebody to make your case about the patterns and things, a big part of how you present the data is how you bend the data, right? Um, that there's, there's something non-trivial to figure out there if you're actually in the business of, of presenting something to somebody. But here it's done for us, and so this is, this is a histogram. And this is an example of a normal distribution. As you can see, it's kind of got like, you can, see, you can kind of see where the average is, right? And it kind of spreads out from there. It looks like a bell, give or take-ish. Um, now, oftentimes it's more interesting, in fact, to look at what's called a relative frequency distribution, and that's down here. So a relative frequency distribution, it's the same data as was in the one above, but let me, let me get this out of the way here. But here, the relative frequency distribution, you're looking at, what's the difference there? Let's see if I can zoom in a bit. Hopefully I won't regret this. So, you see this, it's, it's instead, instead of giving the number of subscribers that it took from zero to five, or you know, um, 30 to 35, right? We had, what, 190? It turns out that that, whoa, 19%? Really? How many total, um, I mean, how many total subscribers were there in this thing? I don't think the book tells us, but if you add together, if you add the number of subscribers, I bet you get, a, you must get a thousand then. <laughs> Lazy. <laughs> That's funny. So I think their I think their number of subscribers total was like a thousand. So if you take 190 divide by a thousand, you get, you know, 0.19 then times 119.2 percent. So the point is anyway, 19.2 percent of the people had a 25 to 30 second download time, right? And so these are all percentage percentages. So what what should the percents add up to? How many percent? A hundred, right? None of that 110 percent garbage. See here, don't believe it. Um, anybody who tells you that's probably trying to sell you something. But um, anyway, th yeah, these should add up to be 100 percent, I believe. And so here's what it, here's what the so this is not a histogram, right? This is well, it is still a histogram, but now it is a quote unquote relative frequency histogram. So so same idea, but now we're comparing relative frequencies. So to calculate how do you calculate frequency? You take the number of things in the bin and you divide by the total number of things and that multiplied by 100 gives you the percent. All right, so <clears throat> moving on here. This allows us, we can talk about percentiles with this kind of data. So this is a good example here. Um, so here we're on example one on, in section 13.4, which I'm just going to project because it takes me forever to write that out. And I think it's better for you if I don't here. 
So here, um, we're given, what we're, what we're given here is a relative frequency um, um, table, right? And then the question is, use the relative frequency distribution table to calculate the percentage of subscribers who, are, who required at least 25 seconds to download the file. All right, so if you look at that, um, so at, what did it say, at least, at least 25 seconds, so that would be what? Um, these cases here, right? Anything from 25 to 30, or 30 to 35, or 35 to 40, 40 to 45, all these cases would be more, 25 or more seconds, right? So all of the ones in red, those are the ones that count. If you add these together, you get 69.1%, right? So what would the, you know, um, what percentile would the um, person who took, you know, um, 25 seconds to download be in? I think he'd be in the, um, I believe he'd be in the 15.2th percentile, give or take. But um, let's see here. So the part B here, it says, um, what's the probability that a subscriber chosen at random will require at least five seconds but less than 20 seconds to download the file? So how'd you figure that out? So what you do, right, less, at least five seconds, so that would be here, but less than, less than 20 would be here, so these three count. So these are 15.2%, so that means that there's a 15.2% chance that um, a subscriber chosen at random will require at least five seconds but less than 20 seconds. So you can figure out questions to probability sampling questions from these kind of tables, all right? But let me move on here. Let's see here. So I need to draw a picture for us. Seven. So what does a normal distribution look like? <laughs> Sorry, I know you guys are about to tell me. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see. Uh-oh, that wasn't good. Mm-hmm, I have angered it. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> so normal distribution, it looks something like this. Let me just draw a picture for you guys. And let's talk about, let's talk about the properties of the normal distribution, okay? So, listen, if you think about, the, so the bins, the, the bin pictures we were just looking at where you have, you know, um, these classes with like 10 possible grades in it, you can think about taking the number of bins and making it more and more, then eventually the shapes that you're getting, they won't be like stair steps anymore, it'll just be like a smooth kind of picture. And so that's what you get, um, the, the sort of continuous version of it, something like the, um, this here. Well, I'll try. All right, so I, I'm, I'm trying. So something like this, is, a, is a, it's, it's kind of a bell shape, all right? If this is a normal distribution, all right, here's y and here's x, we should talk about a few different things, right? First of all, the average, all right, is right down the middle. So this right here is what we would call, typically call mu. All right, and then if you go one standard deviation like this up here, if mu plus sigma, and you can go, if I did it exactly, I mean, if my picture was, I'm going to give up on my own picture here pretty soon, but then you go you, mu minus sigma over here, and then two sigma be over here. So here's mu plus two sigma. Over here is mu minus two sigma. 
then I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to try to put labels in, but here would be three sigmas, and then here's four sigmas, and over here, to the limits of my artistry, here's mu plus five sigma. Over here would be mu minus five sigma. So the, what is the significance of the area under the normal curve? So think about you know this over here, right? The thing we were starting with, this thing here, this, this distribution, my silly made up example. The area of these boxes, what is it? What does it represent? It's the number of scores that are in those bins, right? If you imagine the bins, you know, shrinking so that they're like, you know, really small, you get to this idea. And so the area under this curve corresponds to like the number of X, um, you know, the number of samples that have um, that Y. Let's see here, let me, let me try to put it in a different, different language here. Um, if, this is the, if this is the distribution that corresponds to some um, distribution of data, all right, then that data is said to have a normal distribution. And if I pick, um, if I pick at random, right, if I pick at random um, x, right, so let me just try to be more specific here, just to, so if I pick, if I pick x at random, from this distribution, all right, then there is approximately a 68% chance it falls in the shaded region. What do I mean shaded region? So shaded region, I'm going to do this one here. So right here, this, this piece right here. So the middle. So basically, you know, plus or minus a standard deviation from the average. There's a 68% chance you're within plus or minus one sigma from the average. This is the way the normal distribution works. All right? So how about if you get to two sigmas? What's the percent, what's the likelihood that you pick something, you know, within two sigmas? Well, there's a, there's a nice picture in the book that's better than my picture. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the book's picture here now, if you don't mind. Um, actually, here, I think I can have my cake and eat it too. Do, do, do. This is not going to make scanning it helpful, but some old school editing here. So there you go. Um, so the book has this lovely picture. And so what's going on here is, so within plus or minus the first de uh, standard deviation, you get 68% chance that you're going to pick something in there. If you go plus or minus two standard deviations, that gives you actually 95% of the data. There's a 95% chance that if you pick something at random from a, a standard distribution, you're going to get something within plus or minus two standard deviations of the average. All right? If you go to three standard deviations, plus or minus three standard deviations, there is a 99.7% chance that you're going to pick something in there. So what this means is to get something that is beyond three, if you pick something at random from such a distribution, right, and you have a standard deviation, if you're more than three standard deviations away from the average, that means there is a less than, you know, there's like a less than, there's like a 0.03% a chance that you can do that. Right? So the, the, the usual standards and practices for um, introductory statistics is if you have three sigma or more for your data, that's known as, a, as an outlier. All right? An outlier is something that's beyond three sigma. Okay? Um, in theoretical physics, there are things like this. And so there are experimental groups. If you have a, 
a new result in physics and the uh, uncertainty of your result is within like, if it's like three sigma, three standard deviations, um, that will get attention. You'll get stories written on it, but it's not accepted typically by the standard community, the scientific community until you get to like five standard deviations for the statistics on theoretical physics these days. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting video about that. I, if you're interested, I can show you. But um, Anyway, so this gives you all kinds of word problems, right? So let's try to, try to do some of them. If I can find one. All right, so let's see here. Ah, rats. Actually, I don't think I have. I guess we'll just take a, we'll, we'll, we'll chew on number one here. Let's see if we can work this one, okay? Let's see if we have time to do it. It says, find the area, find the area to the nearest, nearest thousandth of the standard normal distribution between the, the given z-scores. So here, here we have um, z equals 1.12 and z equals 1.9. Uh, so what does this mean? So we're, 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 we're talking about a standard normal distribution. What's that? So the book explains further, standard normal distribution is one for which, well, anybody, I'll ask the question, anybody, can anybody answer that for me? What is a standard normal distribution? So a standard normal distribution is one for which you have made the standard deviation work out to one. So like here's the standard normal distribution, a picture of it is this. So the standard, so like the, um, the, the standard normal distribution, you've, you've made the center of it at zero, right? And the average is zero and the standard deviation has been, been made to one. So you can take your original normal distribution, you shift it to zero and then you kind of shrink it or stretch it out such that the standard deviation is one. That's what the standard normal distribution is. And the, the, the idea basically is you can use z-scores to kind of bridge the gap from the, the original normal distribution versus the standard normal distribution. So let's sort through it here. Um, so here we're asked to find the area to the nearest thousandth of the standard normal distribution between the given z-scores. How do you do this? So like the, here's a picture of what's going on, right? you've got this distribution, right? And um, if your z-score is 1.12 and 1.19, where, where is that? It's like here and here, right? So z-score of 1.12 means that you're at, you know, 1.12 and this one is 1.9. So like the z, the, z the, the, the standard normal distribution has z-scores, um, basically. And so you're trying to figure out the area of this thing right here. And like, that's kind of hard, right? Because my picture's not very accurate. And also, you know, well, to figure out area under a curve, what do you need? How do you, how do you find areas under curves? Use calculus, right? Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't, I don't know, but there is a normal distribution table, all right? So, um, yeah, whoa, indeed. Um, so we're, we're looking for the, so the way this works is you wanna find basically the, um, you wanna find the one, you wanna find the area like from this piece right here that area and then that area you're going to subtract from the bigger area 